This indeed is a day which the Lord has made to rejoice and to be glad in it. And so we welcome you that are here helping us with the worship service and for those who are joining us uh, live streaming, we uh, greet you and welcome you and join together our hearts in this time of worship. We'll begin our worship service with the call to worship, which is based on Psalm 62. Please stand as you're able. For God alone, our souls wait in silence. In God alone, our spirits find peace. For God alone is our rock and our salvation. In God alone does our faith remain unshaken. Pour out your hearts before God. For God is our refuge and our strength. Put your trust in God. Please remain standing and join me for the opening prayer. Holy One, God of all creation, you call us to be your people, to carry your religion in this time and place, to go where you sent us to help welcome your amazing good news. As we gather in the presence of the risen Christ to spread the news that your realm is near, fill us with your Holy Spirit. O God of all creation, fill us with your glorious spirit that we may share your good news with the world in need. And now please listen as Kara Gunning and Kathy, and we're so pleased that Linda could join us again, so we'll have a trio today. And they're going to be singing God of Grace and God of Glory on page 577.
Our scripture reading for today is John 1, verses 43 to 51, if you'd like to follow along. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Next, Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then, Nan then, I'm sorry, then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Gracious God, we give thanks for your word. We give thanks for this day, the privilege that we have to worship and to gather and to study, to think about your word, to think about your presence with us and the call of your Holy Spirit. Now we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit into our midst, into our hearts, touch us in a powerful way that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Dr. Tom Long tells a story about a, a young actor named by the name of Tom Key. He was playing the part of Jesus in the play The Cotton Patch Gospel, and he was clearly bringing down the house. The play, a romping bluegrass musical which depicts the ministry of Jesus as, it had occurred, as if it had occurred uh, in the cotton fields and the Baptist churches of rural uh, South Georgia, was in its final performance run, and Key was feeling confident and even inventive with his lines. His spontaneous enthusiasm was contagious, and he had uh, forged a, a link between himself and the audience, a rare bond of mutual exchange and appreciation. So during the scene depicting the Sermon on the Mount, he, as Jesus, suddenly turned to the group on the stage, he, he turned from the group of his disciples on the stage and pointed to a blank auditorium wall and said, look, look at the lilies in that field. The uh, he stopped, almost as if he had forgotten his lines. He peered around at the disciples, focused again on the audience, and repeated, Look at the lilies in that field. Once more he stopped and seemed to be searching for the next words. 
The audience began to shift uncomfortably, his hands extended yet again to the blank wall, and this time he spoke the words slowly and deliberately. Look at the lilies in that field. Now he turned to his disciples and shrugged his shoulders and said, I can't get them to look. The room filled with laughter as it dawned on the audience that he really wanted us, the audience, to look. And sure enough, when he gave one more try, look at the lilies in the field, all the heads in the auditorium turned to the blank wall. He goes on to say, I don't know if John the Baptist was in the audience at uh, that play or not, but it certainly was up his alley. The, the Gospel of John is all about looking at Jesus. Who is Jesus? Light and dark, vision and dimness. Once I was blind, but now I see. These are the materials of John's Gospel. Chapter after chapter, John points his finger towards his Lord, and his voice sounds the refrain, look, look, look. The willingness to look and see stands at the center of this story. Now, some of you may have wondered about the scripture reading because it was the one that we used last week, but this week we want to focus a little bit more on the Nathaniel part of it. The, the, the second half of this reading. Last week we, we talked about in this sermon series that we're doing, Come and See, we, we talked about Jesus invites us to come and think. Come and see means come and think. Use your, your reason, uh, uh, observe, uh, test, um, uh, analyze Jesus. Use your brain and think about Jesus. And it means follow. It means not just give a, an intellectual assent, but Jesus is calling us to follow, to not just know about Jesus, but to fall in love with Jesus until our lives are intertwined with his. And we pointed out how come and see means it always involves a community that we come and see in, in a group with other people. It's usually, we're here, most of us, because somebody told us to come and see. Maybe our parents, maybe a friend, but somebody called us, somebody invited us to come and see. Today, we turn our attention to come and wonder. Come and wonder. Look, looking is the first step of seeing. And John, in this first part of the, the passage that we read, John turns to Jesus. It's not the first time he's done it. He, he's done it earlier in this chapter, but he turns to Jesus and says, Look, the Lamb of God. And he's addressing two of his disciples, or at least two of his disciples, of John's disciples, are there. So it's important to recognize that they're already disciples. They're already following. They're already seekers. They're already looking for answers and for spiritual, a, a spiritual um, uh, purpose. And John says, look, the Lamb of God. I'm convinced that the primary reason that mainline churches like our own United Methodist Church are declining, and some would even say dying, which unfortunately might be the case in some places, is because we have taken our eyes off from Jesus. And as a result, we're not bringing anybody to Jesus. We're not inviting anyone to come and see. That's why you know, I, I, I have kind of, the Lord has been speaking to me a lot over the past few months. And, and, and I really, I, I want you to know that, that my sermons will always involve some form of an invitation to come to Jesus and find Jesus and follow Jesus. And it will involve an invitation. I think we need to give people an invitation to come and see Jesus. 
Now, how do we do that? I mentioned last week that I'm drawing a lot of my inspiration from Tim Keller and some of his thoughts on this passage, and he points out that, that there are three keys to bringing people to Jesus, of doing this, this whole business of what we call evangelism that are in the text. The first one is patience. I, I mentioned that it wasn't the first time that John said, look, look at the Lamb, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin. He, he said it over and over again, even in this first chapter. And it took him at least three or four times to say that before his disciples, even the ones that were attracted to, to spiritual things. It took three or four times for the disciples to actually look at Jesus. So we need patience. We need to, to, to just give the invitation and courage. We need courage. I, I, Nathaniel uh, responds to, to Philip in a, in a, with a very good question. And I think this is probably one of the reasons why a lot of us don't don't share Jesus with other people, why we don't invite people, why we don't say much about our faith to other people is because we're afraid that they're going to ask us a question that we can't answer. And I can guarantee you that they will. There are good questions. There are, there are really good reasons not to believe. There are really good um, uh, objections and, 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 and uh, skeptical points about faith. And notice, I, I love what Philip does. We don't know anything much about Philip other than this little bit here and a few other little tiny snippets. Uh, Philip, uh, from all uh, that we can gather, was a pretty ordinary guy. Didn't have a lot of, a lot of skills, a, you know, wasn't exceptional or anything, was just an average person. But I love what he said. When, when Nathaniel asked him this really tough question, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And obviously, Nathaniel probably was a better biblical scholar. He, he had studied the, 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 the Torah and the, and the prophets um, because that's the way Philip says, this is, this, we found the person who, who Moses and the prophets were talking about. And so, He's talking to Nathaniel, and so Nathaniel knows the, the, the scriptures. And he, he says, well, don't the scriptures say that the Messiah is supposed to come out of Bethlehem? And where does this guy come from? He's coming from Nazareth, so how can that be? He, he asks a great question. And, and I love the way that, that Philip responds. He says, I don't know. I don't know. It's all right to say, I don't know. There are... The more older I get, the, the more I realize that there are just a lot of things I don't know. I, I don't have answers for. He just simply says, Philip says, come and see. And then I love what he does also. There is, as Tim Keller points out, that Philip has this confident humility. The humility to say, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. There's no spiritual arrogance that that seems to be a part of so much of Christianity, that we, that we seem to have this kind of spiritual smugness or arrogance as though we had all the answers. But he does have a confidence. He has a confidence in the Holy Spirit. He has a confidence that God will be the one who speaks to our hearts. He says, I don't know, but come and see. Come and check it out. Let's find out. He trusts that God will do it. And that's, that's been so key to me to realize that it's not, I don't have the answers. And no amount of, uh, of great preaching or wise words or, or tremendous logic is going to bring anybody to Jesus. Ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit. It's God who brings people to Jesus. All we have to do is do the inviting. So it's not just come and think, come and follow, come with others, but what I want to focus on, there's one last thing in the text here. We're invited to come and experience wonder. Come and experience wonder. To have your mind blown, in a sense. And, and to, 
to come. Ha, have you ever read a book or, or seen a movie or had an experience that was just so amazing and you wanted to tell people about it, but you didn't have the words, you didn't have the, 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 the mental constructs to, to convey really what that was about. Have you ever had that experience? I, I was thinking about uh, the time, an experience, and one of the experiences that just came to mind was I had taken the, the girls one time when they were quite little, uh, not, not little, but they were, they were old enough to ski, let's put it that way. They were old enough to go skiing, and we went up to Caberfay. We just got in the car early in the morning, drove up to Caberfay to go skiing for the, the day, and it was just a day trip, and so I, we were gonna come back late at night, and. So we were coming back late at night, drop, driving across that stretch. Some of you may know it there by Kalkaska and things up, up north. And, and the northern lights were, were just spectacular. The northern lights were just playing across the sky like this ripply curtain, uh, just shimmering, changing colors and things. And I woke the girls up and I said, you know, look, look, look at what's going on. And they were just wide-eyed about that. And, and they still talk about that and to this day. It, 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 we, for about 20 miles or 30 miles, we, we just watched the Northern Lights as we drove. You know, not another car in sight. And, but to explain that to somebody, I can tell you what it was you know, in words, but you really had to be there. You had to experience it. You had to, to come and see, to come and experience wonder. You know, wonder, Oftentimes, just it, it, it goes outside of our bounds to talk about, to, to really completely convey. It's outside of our mental capacity and our construct. So we need to come and see. In the text, Jesus says to Nathaniel, you will see greater things than this. He invites him to come and see wonder. Jesus calls us to an adventure that is beyond our wildest understanding. He invites us to wonder. And there are two, really two parts of this adventure that Jesus, or really two, uh, two halves of this adventure that, adventure that Jesus is calling Nathaniel and calls all of us to. The first part of that adventure, he calls us to a wondrous adventure of personal transformation. Uh, uh, a wondrous ad adventure of coming to know who we are and what our purpose is and what we really are all about. Uh, think about a person in your own life who has been a real mentor, a real influence in your life. What, what makes that person so exciting and so influential? What, what made it so exciting when you found that person? Maybe, maybe it was your spouse. Um, maybe it was a, a, a really wise counselor that you, you came across. Maybe it was a professor in, in, in college or in a teacher in school that, that, you, that just seemed to know you and seemed to understand you. And what was so exciting about that was that you were excited by the possibility first of figuring out something about yourself, of getting information about who am I and why am I here and what is it all about? And you were excited that someone thinks enough about me to ponder me, to, 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 to consider me, to consider me significant. That, that we were, that's what makes it so exciting. New information and affirmation. But we find that there is a limit in all of those relationships. All of us have limits. We have our human limitations. We can only know someone else up to a point. And we can only love someone up to a point. We are human. But Jesus says to Nathaniel, behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Guile is the, the old King James word, the old English word, I, I love the word. It's really a word that means there is no deceit, no, no falsehood, that here is a person who is, is transparent and, and doesn't have ulterior motives. Behold, an Israelite in whom there is 
no deceit, no falsehood, no, um, no pretension. Now, do you think Nathaniel was that when Jesus said that to him? I, I, I think if you read between the lines in the text, it's questionable. Rather, rather, Nathaniel really was that kind of a person. His response to Philip is pretty sarcastic. You know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And, and, and he seems pretty skeptical in some ways. And, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. But I, I think what this text tells us is that, first of all, Jesus sees what we can be. Jesus sees us for who we really are. And, and he calls us to become what we are not yet. The, the, he calls us. Notice the, the text. Notice early on in this text, in the very beginning, he, he sees Peter. And he says, when he looks at Peter, he says, Pete, you are, you are uh, he changes his name to Cephas, to rock. You are the rock. On, and later on, he goes on to say, you're the rock on whom I'm going to build my church. Well, if you look at Peter's life, he seems like anything but a rock. I mean, a little girl questions him in the courtyard when Jesus is on trial about, aren't you one of him? And, and he says, he goes off like a scared little boy and says, oh, I never knew the man. Until it gets to the point where he's cussing and swearing and says he never knew Jesus. I mean, is that a rock? You know, uh, all the other times, there are other times that, that, that Peter seems to be pretty wishy-washy. He seems to be pretty weak when it comes to being a rock. But Jesus looks at him at the very beginning of the ministry and looks at Peter and says, you are the rock. You are a rock and I will build my church on your faith. He looked at Nathaniel and said to Nathaniel, look, an Israelite in whom there is no God. And look at all, there are passages all over in the Old Testament. Almost all of the great heroes of faith. Look at Gideon. God shows up to, you know, to Gideon in the story of Gideon. And Gideon is threshing, threshing wheat in a cistern. Now, if you know anything about threshing wheat, that's not a very good place to thresh wheat because you've got to have some wind to blow the chaff away. But he's down in a pit. Uh, thrashing wheat and, and 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 he even by his own admission is the least of his clan and his clan is one of the least of the the clans of all the Israelites so he's like at the bottom of the barrel but the angel of God shows up to Gideon and says to him Gideon oh mighty man of valor I could just imagine that that Gideon you know looked around and said where is this mighty man of valor <laughs> the angel's talking to him. You know, God sees us for what we can be and calls us and invites us and helps us. His call helps us to become what we can really be. Look at Jacob. Jacob, who is a deceiver. Uh, uh, his name means deceiver. Uh, one who takes things that don't belong, doesn't belong to him. And when he lives up to his name because he steals his brother's birthright and, and blessing. And yet Jesus, uh, that God shows up to Jacob and changes his name to Israel, which means blessed. You are a blessing. You are one who contends with God. There are examples all through the Bible about how God calls us, looks at us, and sees us for who we are, who we can be. And his call helps us to become what we are not yet. Jesus sees Nathanael and says, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathanael's first response then is, well, how do you know me? You, you, you got me right, I, I like that, I, I like that. Uh, kind of uh, way that you've identified who I am, but how do you know me? And then Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. We don't know what was going on. I, I just, you know, we're just left to wonder. I think it's, it, it's open-ended. 
um, we're left to, to wonder what was what was Nathaniel doing under the fig tree? What was going on? What was happening? What, what was he doing under the fig tree? We don't know. That, that's one of the, the, the keys to uh, an eyewitness account. But whatever it was, it was so intimate and so private and so personal that no other human, it was something that Nathaniel had not shared with another human being and knew that no one else could possibly know this, what he was doing, what was going on under that fig tree. But Jesus says, I saw you. And it was, it, it, it was, it took Nathaniel aback so much. He, he recognized that, wow, this is not just a, just another human being who, who knows something about me, but he really knows me. He knows my deepest secrets. Jesus knows everything there is to know about us and loves us and praises us. See, he's praising Nathaniel and, and he praises us. There, there's never been a friend or a counselor or a lover like this, like Jesus. Jesus knows us even better than we know ourselves. So Jesus invites Nathanael to a wondrous inward journey of self-discovery and transformation. He says, you believe because I said I saw you under the fig tree? That's nothing, Nathanael. You're going to learn. It's just going to be amazing what you're going to learn about yourself and about what you're, what you're really capable of, what, what, what you can do connected to me, following me. But he doesn't stop there. Jesus doesn't stop with only that. Jesus goes on to invite Nathaniel and all of us to a wondrous outward and upward journey. Jesus goes on to say to Nathaniel, truly, truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, to those disciples, and to us, I am the fulfillment of all of those biblical stories that you've read about. Remember, Nathaniel's a, a, a biblical uh, a scholar. He knows something about the Torah, and he knows something about the prophets. He's heard the stories. Nathaniel knew Moses and the prophets. He knew, for instance, about the story of Jacob and Jacob's vision. And it would have come to mind almost instantly when, when Jesus says, you will see heaven open and the angels of heaven ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He, he would have, it would have come to his mind almost immediately that, that passage where Jacob is running for his life. He feels like he's lost everything. He's deceived his brother out of his birthright, and he has to run for his life because his brother wants to kill him now. And so he's, he's a, a alone and lost, and he's in the wilderness, and he lays down, and he has this vision, and he sees the ladder. Some of you may have sung the song in Sunday school or vacation Bible school sometime, you know, about Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Every rung gets higher, higher. We're climbing Jacob's ladder. So he would have had that come to his mind almost instantly. Jesus is saying, I am the story that all the other stories point to. I am the story to which all the other legends point to, not only the biblical stories, but all of the stories of life. You know, we can even think of our own modern fairy tales. What about Beauty and the Beast? You know, uh, you know, where, where, you know, if somebody truly loves us, we're transformed into who we really are. You know, what about, what about Sleeping Beauty? You know, you know that, that, we're, that we're asleep and we're just waiting for someone to come and, and, and kiss us into new life, into resurrection. And all of the stories, all of these legends are really point to Jesus, and Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, I am 
the story to which all of these other stories point to. No, he says, you think that's something, just, just wait. There is wonder beyond your imagination. And I can just imagine then Nathaniel is thinking, how do I get into that story? I think that's the miracle of how the Holy Spirit uses our invitations to others to come and see. That Nathaniel is intrigued. He's probably thinking, how do I get into that story? Do I have to read my Bible every day? Do I have to pray and meditate? Do I have to really be holy and righteous and, and, and really follow a lot of, lots of rules? Or, or uh, do I have to, you know, have a, a checklist every day about uh, and check off all the good things I've done. Jesus simply says, I think, in, many, in not so many words, no. No. Because all of that boils down to, you know, what the other thing that came to mind is the Led Zeppelin song. And uh, you know, some of you are my generation, and you know that song, Stairway to Heaven. And, and, and you know, it begins by the, the, the whole thing that, that there's a lady, I'm sure, who thinks that all, uh, all that glitters is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. That, we're, that, that all, all of our religious stuff ultimately <laughs> boils down to trying to buy a stairway to heaven. And Jesus is saying, no. Nathaniel, that's not how you do it. You won't be able to, to buy a stairway to heaven. Like the psalmist says, who, who is worthy to ascend to the heavens? Only the pure of heart and the righteous, and none of us are completely righteous. None of us are pure in heart. So how do we get there? Jesus is saying to him in verse 50 through, uh, 51, he says to Nathaniel, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending. Where? Where? On the Son of Man. Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, it's not, it, it, you don't get to heaven by constructing a stairway, by constructing a ladder, by, by trying to construct some kind of a religious ladder to heaven. I am the stairway. The angels are descending and, and ascending on the Son of Man. I am the stairway. Jesus doesn't stand at the top of the ladder staring down at us and say to, to us, try your best. You know, if you just try harder, if you just work a little bit more, if you, if you just uh, try to be a little bit more holy and a little bit more righteous, maybe you can, maybe you can work your way up to me. Jesus isn't saying that. Jesus is saying to Nathaniel and these disciples and to us, I came down to where you are. I came down to you. Jesus came to us and Jesus says, I came to bring you to heaven. I, I lived the life you should have lived. I died the death you should have died. And I came to get you, not to, uh, came not to get you, but to bring you to God. So his invitation to Nathaniel, to these other disciples, and to us is trust in me. Give your life to me. Follow me. And if you do, you will see heaven open. <laughs> And all it takes is simply to say, Jesus, I give you my life. Amen. I want to thank all of you for your continued generosity and your continued faithfulness those who are joining with us as you're live streaming, we give thanks for your presence and for your faithfulness in continuing to give, support the ministries of this church. Those who are watching and may not have a church home, 
we invite you to our church home, but if you have other church homes, we invite you to support their ministries and those nonprofits that are in such need during this time as well. So take this time to think about and to celebrate generosity, God's generosity to us, and how we can be generous to others as we listen to Larissa Clark. Thank you for your invitation to come and see, to come to think, to come and follow, to come with others, to come experience wonder and excitement beyond our belief and our understanding. Lord, if there is anyone this day who has prayed that prayer, give their life to you. We lift them up and pray for them that you would strengthen them and continue this wonderful, wondrous journey. Lord, we lift up those on our prayer list who need prayers for healing and wholeness. We continue to pray for Jane Barnes and we pray for Carol McIntyre. We pray for Rick Martinez for Peggy Robinson and her family, loss of loved ones. Lord, we pray that you would be with those who need healing and wholeness, who know that you can bring physical healing, that you heal not only our broken bodies, but our broken spirits. So Lord, we lift up those who may be facing hardship and challenge and difficulties you would send your peace, your comfort, your strength to those who are grieving, those who have sinned, and those who may feel lost and alone. Lord, we lift up those who are assuming new positions of authority and responsibility. We pray that you would bless them and give them wisdom and direction. We pray for our own bishop and for the cabinet during this time, appointments and 
all of the business of the church. We think especially of our bishop who is uh, covering two conferences. We ask that you would give him strength and bless his family and bless uh, him as he makes decisions that you would give him wisdom. Lord, we pray that you would be with those who are working for your kingdom around the world, those who are working for peace. We pray that you would bless them. You have promised that the peacemakers are blessed in a special way. We pray that you would be with those who are working to help people rebuild their lives in places that are torn by natural disasters or man-made disasters by war and fighting. Lord, we pray that you would be with all of those who are worshiping today, all of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. We know that many are facing challenges and difficulties and some face persecution for their faith. And so, Lord, we lift them all up join with your church universal in praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power of and the glory for us. Our closing hymn is I Am Thine, O Lord. It's 419 if you have a hymn. No. We'll listen as Carol, Kathy, Linda said.
couple of announcements that I'll share with you. First uh, announcement is that uh, on January 29th from 5 to 6 p.m. we're looking for volunteers uh, who are needed to help assemble and pack Lenten materials at church for delivery to Good Shepherd members by Ash Wednesday. And uh, we'll practice social distancing and wear masks. Oh, there's a sign-up sheet. This is uh, this Friday. It's this Friday. And it's this Friday. So there's a sign-up sheet for those who are here helping us out. Um, and it's it'll be at the back. And those uh, who are online who would like to participate, if you would uh, contact the church or uh, get in touch with us, we'd uh, love to have you. And then on uh, February 12th from 4 to 5 p.m., we invite you to join with us as we deliver 345 Valentine treats to our friends across the street at Sisson and Hubbard Manor West uh, to the residents there. We're going to be sharing with them and we'll practice social distance. We'll wear masks and gloves. So if you would like to participate in that, those that are here helping us are invited to sign the sign-up sheet and those that are um, participating with us online, please get in touch with the church if you would like to be a part of that. And uh, so we invite you to come. Our Thursday night Bible study continues. We've had a really good time sharing. So we invite you to do that. If you'd like to join, please let me know, send uh, your information to the church so we can send you the Zoom link. We're doing it on Zoom. And I think those are most of the announcements. So receive this blessing and this benediction. May the God who called you, called you to wonder and to an amazing journey, may he fill you and empower you and strengthen you. And God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and go with you. Go out into the world to serve him.